places that I've never been Seeing things that I may never see again I can't wait to get on the road again I'm Susan Regan for Connecticut Valley Views, and we're here today at the Connecticut Historical Society, and I am with Elizabeth Abbey. She's Director of Public Outreach here right. at the Society. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, You're Susan. You're so nice to give us the time. It's wonderful to have you here. Welcome to our home. Oh, it's beautiful. Now, this home uh -huh. was originally whose home? This was the home of Curtis Veter, who was one of the founders of the Veter Root Company, and he made his money through counting devices that were used in the early automobiles. And he was an engineer. And this was his home, and it's built as you would expect an engineer's home to be built. It's solid, it's beautiful, it's wonderfully crafted. And, and, and very spacious. And I think this is something new that you were telling me earlier. Right. That this is a kind of an unknown fact that this building was his home. Exactly. Well, in the past, we came here in 1950, mm -hmm. and it felt to us like, oh, this is an old house that we have to make into a museum and a library. And then in recent years, people have said, wow, this is really cool, a 1928 house. Tell us about the house. So we really never told that story before recently, and we're finding a lot of interest in it because it's a granite building. The woodwork, as you can see, is just beautiful. And the detailing of it is like something you've never seen before. So we're just starting so to tell his story. So it's history within a history. That's right. History That's right. Starting history. to tell his story. Well, speaking of history, I believe you were recently on Dennis House's program. That's right. Which is where I first saw That's you. Right. And I was totally intrigued, as right. I think most of Connecticut <laughs> was, because right. you were talking about G. Fox and Company. Right. And Mrs. Auerbach. Right. And so forth. Now, that particular program. That's not featured here. Tell us just a little bit about how you take that out to the public. Right. That was, Dennis called me at Christmas time because everybody related to G. Fox at Christmas and he said, gee, can you come over and talk to us about mm -hmm. G. Fox? And mm -hmm. I jumped at the opportunity because we have a huge collection of G. Fox material, both materials that were sold at G. Fox, family papers, business records, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, this is a story to tell about one aspect of our collections that people can relate to. So it's one of our outreach programs. So I go all over the state, mm -hmm. and I talk to senior centers mm -hmm. and historical societies, and people love it because it brings them back to a place and a time where they were so happy and they have such wonderful memories of. And when they leave, they say, wow, I'm going to be thinking about this all day long. They'll remember shopping with their mother, it spending was a their day. It was a total destination. It was a day long visit mm -hmm. to Hartford. Yep. And it, the whole family remembers. That's the children right. Remember and as you say, you wear your white gloves and your hat. That's right. <laughs> and, and you were in the Connecticut room. Connecticut room. And it mm -hmm. was a special thing to do. It was. So you're able to take that program and bring it to the it people. Right. But you have so many things here that are very unique. That's true. And I think we need That's to true. share that let's with do our it. viewers. And we're going to take them through G Fox it. is just a small part. Great. Well, sure. Let's do it. So I'd like to ask you. Um, you are director here. What does that entail? How long have you been here? And you know the general staff. How many people work here, and do you have volunteers? We have we have volunteers absolutely. As far as me, I uh, started here in 1973 mm -hmm. as the librarian. I was right out of library school, and I thought, how great that the mm -hmm. director thinks I'm so wonderful mm -hmm. that he hired me right off the spot. Right. It turns out he had a son two years older than me, still living at home, oh. whom I eventually married. So wasn't he a cagey old yes. guy? Um, so I was here from 1973 to 1985, and mm -hmm. then I left and I did other things. And then Kate Steinway became the director about five years ago, and mm -hmm. I've known her over the course of time, and she said, you love this place. Why don't you come back and be the director of public outreach? And by that, she wanted me to go out and see our members, bring them back and engage them in what we were doing, find out what was important to them, what kind of programs we should offer. Make with the community. What kind of exhibits mm -hmm. we should have. Um, because for many years, people weren't doing that. They weren't going out and asking our members what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nothing's more important than knowing what your donors and members want. So I did that my first year back, and then we've been implementing that. So that's why we have a Making Connecticut exhibit, because so many said, 
I want a place where I can bring family and friends and relatives that tells the Connecticut story. And Kate said, you know, I agree with that. Let's, let's make a, the exhibit Making Connecticut. Um, so we have, we have a sizable staff of people in the library who help with research and mm -hmm. genealogy and anything on uh, Connecticut history. The genealogy thing, now anyone can come down and uh, utilize that library, is that correct? They can, they we're can. We're take a closer they look can. at that They can, they can. Um, and it's really an area of our expertise. Genealogy is a real area mm -hmm. of our expertise. Mm -hmm. And we have a large education staff because we have, well, Year. That's impressive because it, you know, children love to learn. They do. And, and you know, it was something they I do. noticed when they you do. took me around. They do. Every sign says, please touch me. They do. Please open. They do. Please take a look they at do. this. That's good. And when they come here, they have a different sense. They're, they come in and they say, oh, it looks like a castle when you walk through the front door. And they're, they're sort of mesmerized and they're in their best behavior and they're wonderful. And when they leave, um, at, and sometimes we do an evaluation of what they knew before about Connecticut and what they knew what they learned when they leave and it's astounding to see how much they've absorbed and we we are following the Connecticut state curriculum but it's in a whole different way that these children are learning when they come in here a lot of the things that our educators do is through um, dress up and drama mm -hmm. and enactment so it's participation it really is and kids really remember that or, and but I have been in the hall where students who've been here in fourth grade mm -hmm. are now returning in eighth grade and they'll say oh do you remember the tavern signs sure, or something because they were really part of the, it really it makes a big impression it makes a big impression and then they bring their parents back so we love that the education department we have an administrator of course is the executive mm -hmm. director and her staff and then we have uh, a public outreach staff and we take care of the members and donors and you asked about volunteers we love our volunteers and they help us so much because we are rather a small staff compared to what we need to do so they help us with the cataloging and working in the archives mm -hmm. and doing some of the processing that we just don't have the staff to do and the time to do it so someone yeah. might be interested they could give you a call absolutely we, we will absolutely. give your website for absolutely that to, to, to do that. absolutely now I'd like to also mention the fact that that the society is also open for people to hold events here as well is yeah that correct it is the room that we're in is what's called our Hoadley Auditorium you see the tavern signs behind mm -hmm. us and this accommodates easily a hundred people and we do open it up for rentals um, it makes a perfect place for so keep that in mind folks for yeah for an any kind of place event. to be very, it's a very different place for people because they see the tavern signs we like to welcome them we like to make them feel at home so it's more than just a space to rent we like to make people feel like hey you're you're you be our guests mm -hmm. so it's we don't we don't market it so much as we respond to people who have an interest in it. All right, so keep that in mind the yep. next time you want to entertain friends and have a lot of space to do so. That's true. And have a very interesting That's evening. That's true. That's true. All right, well, let's talk about some of these signs. We're standing in front of the Petty Bones yep. one. I think mm -hmm. everybody knows that that's a mm -hmm. famous restaurant in yep. Simsbury. Mm -hmm. But if you could just give us a, a virtual tour, if you will, of some of your key signs here. What you have in here is the collection of a man named Morgan Brainerd, and he collected these in the 1930s and 1940s. And this is when they were in barns, they were some auctions, but for the most part, they were just, they were in private hands and he acquired them and when he passed away, his family donated them to the Connecticut Historical Society. We have 67 of them. It's the largest collection in the country. And what it tells us is about people and travel during that time, because the earliest one we, you saw at the beginning mm -hmm. when you walked in was mm -hmm. 1749 and all it has on it is a depiction of a horse because people were traveling through they just wanted to know where could I bed their horse and, and bed get, myself. And get grog. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. true. <laughs> right. And then um, as travel became more sophisticated and the roads became better they were the taverns became destinations so there's a Carter J. Carter sign over there where they're saying please come here and have your grog and come with a friend and spend the day. Right. So you really learn a lot about the travel business and roads just by looking at the tavern signs but our collection is really a wonderful um, uh, example of folk art. Now when you have this collection such as this particular one and many of the objects um, throughout the society building 
are they given to you? Do you have to purchase them? Mm -hmm. How do you come to acquire them so that you can show them off in a proper setting? Right, that's such a good question. Um, many of the items that we have have been given to us because people feel they want it to go to an institution where it's open and available to the public. And um, be appreciated. And be appreciated. So for example, we have one of the finest collections of needlework, especially Connecticut needlework. Most of those people pieces have been given to us because people feel, I don't want it to be in a private hands. I want the rest of the world to see it. Mm -hmm. And in a minute, I think we'll talk about the Prudence Punderson that mm -hmm. you saw. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an endowment, and the endowment was for the most part created in the 40s and the 50s. And fortunately, we can still draw from that. But it's a very restricted endowment for the mm -hmm. most part. It was an era where people thought, I'm going to leave money to the Connecticut Historical Society so that they can then acquire items pertaining to Connecticut. So we do use that on occasion to purchase something that we think we absolutely need to have. Mm -hmm. But what we try to acquire are things that are the finest example and the most common example of how Connecticut people lived. So we're not always looking for the most beautiful, like this mm -hmm. Pettibone Tavern mm -hmm. sign behind you, but sometimes the most commonplace one. Now, I'm, I'm looking at all the various ones, the various sizes and so forth, and they are from inns and restaurants. Anything else here that's a sign that's different than inns and restaurants? No, it's pretty, pretty much that. It was, it, it was, it's the it hospitality was, it was. signage it was. that was used. In other words, people that's wouldn't true. use it for their home or so much. stabling. These are pretty much the right. hospitality And signs. what you see in some of them, like we're looking here at the Churchill and the Fitch ones, is that you have so many different crafts that are shown in the same item. So you have beautiful ironwork, mm -hmm. filigree that's around that sign. You have some beautiful um, artwork that's done. Because they're basically all handcrafted. They are. Right? Every single one of these has done by, done, been done by hand. And in the later ones, you see that there were actually tavern sign painters. Uh, William Rice was one of them. And they're much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Once you have a tavern sign painter, they're more sophisticated. I kind of like the rough-hewn ones, like the D. Loomis one. You know, you put out a name, you put some, um, so, some glasses yes, and a picture, yes. and come on in. Um, but it's really a wonderful example of, as I say, American folk art. And when the American folk art collectors come here, this is like one of the first places that they like to be. Well, See I have to collection. I, I have to tell you, the genealogy sounds fascinating to me. Yeah. I think we should take a look at Let's that. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Well, we are now in one of the most interesting sections of the Society's facility. It is called the Research Center. And I am here with Carol Whitmer, and she is one of the volunteers who helps people find out anything about anyone, anywhere in the world. Do I have that right? Well, we hope to help people find oh, okay. anyone, anywhere. We try very hard. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what you do, how you go about it. Uh, how you're able to help people uh, find out about genealogy and so forth, and anything else that would be of interest to folks who might like to come down and visit. Well, one of the first things we tell people is start with what you know. So if, and it doesn't matter how much or how little you know, but we always start with what we know. A lot of times people will want to come in and they will want to start 200 years ago, but they really haven't gotten the links up to the present time. So when we start with what we know, we end up finding out a lot more about the people. It makes it a much richer experience. So when people come in, we typically ask them, where do you want to start? What do you know? What, you, what have you looked at? A lot of people come in with a lot of information. They've done a lot of research. And we also have novices who come in who just say, I know who my parents are. I know who my grandparents are and let's go from there. It's a little like doing your taxes, isn't it? You've got your receipts and your stuff and they're all in a, a different box, but you haven't put it all together but yet. But much more fun. Yes, and much more fun. less costly. All right, let me ask you another very basic question. Is there a charge to do this? No, no charge. When, when, when somebody comes into the research center, um, volunteers like myself uh, and the lovely people at the desk and the uh, people who work here are more than willing to help people start their research, point them in the right direction, and show them everything that we've got here. Now, is that Monday through Friday? Are you open on the weekend? We have just speaking. changed our hours. Um, we are open on Thursday afternoon from noon to 5, all day Friday, and all day Saturday. So there is a legacy you can leave for your family if you come down to the Research Center and see such lovely people as Carol to help out. It's free, it's interesting, and it would add greatly to your family to do so. So, Carol, we thank you so much for thank giving you. us a, a, a little bit about what you do and how helpful you can be to people. We do appreciate it. Oh, great. All Thanks. Right. And we will uh, go back to our tour.
are now in Making Connecticut, is that right, this area? That's, what that's what do we exactly have? exactly right. This is our newest and permanent exhibit called Making Connecticut. And we say it was 400 years in the making because it's it starts from the Native Americans and it brings us right up through the 19 to the present uh, 1990s, 19, 2000, and 2010. So it, it's the full range of Connecticut history. Oh, you and you've got how many exhibits here? It goes from the early times. How many are there in this here, in this individual? area? Yes. In this, uh, there are in this one gallery. There's probably five or six different areas from colonial through the 1860s and 1820s and then into the present day. So it's really broken up, but it's arranged by chronological period. And you've truly captured the essence of each of those eras. We have. Um, you'll notice that when you're in the colonial period, you see the Native American side and you see the colonist side. Um, and then we have the federal period. We have the um, period with, where the immigrants start to show up, and then we get into, um, you know, the wars mm -hmm. and Connecticut works. So it's the real, it's the whole gamut of Connecticut history. It's been a challenge. It's been a challenge to put it all together. All right, let's take a closer look. Let's do that. All right. Now is one of the most wonderful pieces that we have in the Connecticut Historical Society collections. Done by a young woman, 26 years old, whose name was Prudence Punderson. On the bottom, she has written the first, second, and last scene of mortality by Prudence Punderson. She did this in 1783. When women were making samplers or doing embroideries, she creates a self-portrait. It's radically different from anything else in American art, radically different from anything that was being done at the time. She depicts here on the right herself as a baby in a cradle with her black uh, slave who's watching over her. There's a picture within a picture that we're still trying to solve. In the center, she depicts herself with artist tools. These are not needlework tools and artist tools because she considers herself an artist. And then she has her own coffin where she's put her initials PP for Prudence Punderson. What this tells us is just rich with story. It tells us what a colonial house looked like, how they hung the draperies, how they covered the mirror when there was a death, the kinds of furniture that they had, how she was dressed, what the floor looks lo looked like. This was the rug with um, fringe on it. But for many people, and especially for artists, she speaks to them as a woman and an artist. People have called her the first American woman artist, the Picasso of American art. Um, because the elements that she's put together show a real artistic talent. We do still have the original, which we bring out from time to time when people would like to see it. The reason I love this story and love telling it so much is because I think she was very talented and very sadly, she married um, in a little after 1783. She had a child at the age of 26, her only child, and she died a month later. So. We really don't see all of the work that she could have done, but she was truly, truly gifted. Prudence Punderson. Elizabeth, we were talking earlier about hands-on exhibits mm -hmm. and people could really participate in mm -hmm. history, and I think this is a good example of it. Tell us a little bit about this little furniture, sure. and it looks like a children's outfit here. It is. One of the challenges with this exhibition was to make it interesting for adults and also for kids. And what we have done, you'll see in a number of areas, is have interactives. And that's what this colonial kitchen does. So you have um, a reproduction of that very earliest yes. chair that kids you can actually it. sit in. And we have tables where, where they can sit, they can use the spoons that they would have used in those days. They have an idea of what the early colonial oven looked like. And what they enjoy more than I can even tell you is dressing up in colonial costume. So that's what you see along here. You have a rack of costumes that they love to dress up, they love to pretend, and this is one of the first kitchens, it is the first kitchen in the display, and you'll see elements of kitchens in the rest of Macon, Connecticut. So it's so unique to be able to do this and actually participate just for a little while, pretend you go back. And people, <laughs> this is how people really learn about history is when they're kind of part of making it. It's true. And dressing in it. Right. Dressing that way. All right. We'll take a look at the next one. Now we move on to the kitchen for the 1820 to 1865 period. 
And the reason that we've decided to use kitchens as an anchor for this exhibit is that everything happens in the kitchen. Technology sometimes shows up first in a kitchen. People relate to a kitchen. That's where families spent their time. So there are elements in each of the kitchens that you'll see that are common. In other words, here we have a child's teeter-totter, for lack of a better word. And every exhibit, every part of the exhibit has a child element, whether it's a toy or it's something like this. And I'm amused by that because obviously it, its purpose was to keep the child away from the fire, but I'm sure that many a kid fell downstairs uh, with walking with that. It looks like a pretty good cage to me. <laughs> <laughs> it does. And then we have the old tin um, tub. So there's obviously elements about washing and cleaning and keeping clean that are, uh, is in each of the kitchen. And there's usually a Native American piece in each of them as well. I believe the basket up there is Native American. Um, two things also to pay attention to in this kitchen are these wonderful, it's called fouling guns, and they are quite rare and we acqu acquired those relatively recently. And because we like to promote our Connecticut newspapers, there's two here, examples here of both the Hartford Times and that venerable Hartford Daily Current that we have on the table. Now in the kitchen for 1865 to 1918, and your eye is obviously drawn to this massive stove. And I think this is where the exhibit goes from being historical and colonial and in the past to somewhat nostalgic because I think a lot of us actually remember a big cast iron stove by, like this. There's a funny story behind this because we actually bought it for this exhibition. So not only did a woman, uh, wasn't she, well, she was able to sell it to us, but she had five guys who went over to her house and that's how many it took to get it out of her kitchen. But it's very impressive and it's very indicative of the time. I also love the um, poster above it, Death on Dirt. Um, again, it's bringing out those themes of cleaning, which is in each of the kitchen displays. And take a look at that um, uh, washing, washing machine, machine <laughs> where you just think, gee, things are a lot easier these days than having to dump it in there and try to squeeze out the soap and the water and then hang it up on the line. And one of my favorites is, and it's a favorite among one of the curators who works here, Mike, is this wonderful dust pan where you could dust in the dark because it has a candle and there's a little place to put your foot. So, you know, this is for the housewife of the mid-19th um, century where you probably didn't have the best light all the time, but look at that. You could have a lighted dust pan. Necessity is the mother of invention. It's so true. Isn't that true? Moving on from 1918 to 1945, and pay attention, please, to the <laughs> lightweight vacuum cleaner um, that probably weighs 100 pounds, um, but it was one of the, its earliest... Uh, one of the best of its days, and it's a good sign of how technology, how far it came, and how far it's come. And this kitchen actually reminds me of one where we lived in Manchester early in my marriage, and we didn't have any kitchen counters because what you would have, we lived in a very early house, um, what you would have is the stove and a table, and then you'd have a pantry. Um, but a lot of people visit this exhibit and they look at that floor and they say, wait a second, that floor is so familiar to me. It's bringing back all of those memories of my childhood. It's actually linoleum, isn't it? which we now call linoleum, but people correct you and say, no, it's vinyl. That's true. <laughs> That's true. The stoves are what people identify with. Don't you, don't you notice that? It's cent the center of the house. It, they it's do. It's the center of they the family. Do. They do. And I bet that that toaster still works and it makes better toast than anything you can make. I bet the stove today. still works. I bet it does. All right, Elizabeth, what I see here is more. Please open me, hands-on right. exhibit. This is a, another one of the kitchens where we encourage children to come in and play and dress up and pretend they're eating the fruit. And I'm actually amused by this because this is a kitchen pretty much from the 1980s. And you'll see items that I think I still have. Tupperware, orange Tupperware. Uh, in fact, when you open up one of these cupboards, you see Tupperware that was brought in for this exhibit by the staff. Um, and I'm wondering how they, how they could even part with it. Some of these things you, you have used for years and years and you can't imagine not having. Um, a rotary phone, which we joke and say for some children, this 
is a, looks like a butter churn to them. They're, it's so uh, un, unusual and, and they've never seen one. Um, the kinds of cookbooks that we had, The French Chef by Julia Child. And if you can look in here, this is a meat grinder that many people still have. So this is when we're coming to the present day in our kitchens and TV and is exhibition. center and front and center. Always has been, hasn't it? Let me ask you a question, Elizabeth. As we were coming down the stairs there, I saw a room that was full of, it looked like furniture or made from trees. Right. What, what was that about? That's one of our temporary exhibits, and that will be here through the end of March, called New Life for Connecticut Trees. And it's two young men, Ted and Zed Esselstein. And what they've done is they have rescued trees from landfills and trees that were just cut down uh, and they've made them into innovative beautiful furniture and I would encourage people to see it because it's something that will be a surprise for them when they come here to the Connecticut Historical Society. I also noticed that there are signs I saw it, it said please sit in me. Isn't that great? It, you can try it, put your hands on it, touch and it. And it and it's engaging because you want to touch it. It's so smooth and so beautiful but we encourage people to come in and see the exhibit and sit in it as I think you did, didn't you? Exactly, <laughs> I did. It was beautiful. It was, it was, it was just, it's, it was an exciting looking room. It was. So you folks really have to come down and see that mm -hmm, one, especially mm -hmm. while it's still here. I believe it's through March. Through March. All right. Well, while we're talking about calendars and timing and so forth, um, I know we can go to the website for hours. You we're can. standing here in the gift shop. Yes. You'll be able to get something here as a little memory yes. from your visit yes. here. But we yes. talked earlier, too, about being a member. Yes. And um, we have here membership dues. It looks like an individual, yes. $40. Yes. Household, 50 so that would be a family. Yes. And I guess a discount five dollars would be a student, a senior, or an out-of-state person. Yes, is that right? And members always get free admission. We invite them to our programs, free admission to all of our programs. Uh, they receive a newsletter. They receive our annual report. But really, when we survey our members, what we find is that they say the benefits aren't as important to us as just supporting Connecticut and Connecticut history. So it's anyone who believes that it's important for us to be here. And as I mentioned to you a minute ago, Susan, um, we, we're only the caretakers of this wonderful collection. Mm -hmm. I mean, this belongs to everyone. It belongs to you and your children and your descendants. And we're just privileged to be able to take care of it right now as well as we can and let people like you see it, visit us, and do research here. And it's a privilege to work at the Connecticut Historical Society. So I would encourage everyone to become members to really support what we do and the fact that we should exist. Well, you have shown us an immense new treasure for people to come and see. And I would encourage those who have been here before, because you change exhibits from time to we time. Do. So there's always we something do. new. We do. I encourage you to donate uh, to Thank become you. a member. Uh, we look forward to that. And if people would like to find out some more information, I'd like to give the website. Yep. And it is www.chs.org. Thank you again, Thank Elizabeth. You, Susan. It has been a pleasure. It's a pleasure having you here today. All right. And I'd like to give our website where you can see all of our shows, www.ctconnecticutvalleyviews.com. This is Susan Regan. Thank you for joining me and bringing proof to the people. road again Going places that I've never been Seeing things that I may never see again I can't wait to get on the road again